know that Jesus chose a radical Republican and a Democrat on his team. So I want to spend just a portion of time in respect to what's happening in our nation of, uh, of the United States and uh, bring a small uh, message, a small uh, satire, um, which is um, a somewhat of a uh, play on what's happening in our nation and, um, and bring some uh, areas that would underline uh, this, that uh, Jesus chose a radical Republican and a Democrat on his team. And then I want to uh, follow up uh, with a uh, part two on a message entitled, um, The Four Spiritual um, Seasons of Your Life. And I want to really underline that because uh, the emails and the textings that I have been giving, uh, been getting, certainly uh, would underline those areas. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you again for uh, your resurrection power and how uh, I sense like Samson the growing of uh, our uh, spiritual hair again. And even though we are weak uh, physically, uh, I sense the spiritual power uh, of your word and of your Holy Spirit and the love and prayers of the saints. And I thank you for that and would pray that by your uh, spirit and your word that you would gather us together even from the four corners of the earth and bring us to your feet and you would teach us again for you're the great teacher. And so we come and we humble ourselves before you acknowledging that you are King of King and Lord of Lords. And we come and we declare our blessing and our allegiance uh, to you. And we lift up again, O oh God, uh, this uh, nation that we are in in the nations and pray, O oh God, that your will would be done and that you would call us to stand in the gap and to build up the hedges. And we bless and we honor you in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, a amen. Beloved, uh, again, if you have your Bible, we'll just have two uh, scriptures in respect to this uh, uh, sermonette. Did you know that Jesus chose a radical Republican and a Democrat on his team? Uh, the first uh, scripture will be found in Matthew chapter 10, 2 through 4. Matthew chapter 10, 2 through 4 will be your first scripture. Now, while you're turning to that, I want to issue a disclaimer on this uh, introductory message or sermonette that I personally voted for candidates that voiced and declared biblical policies. So I'm going to issue a disclaimer for, uh, for, each, uh, for, for my life uh, today is that I personally voted for candidates that voiced and declared uh, biblical policies regardless of their political affiliations, regardless of their skin color, or any other biases known to mankind. I have friends that are Republicans. I have friends that are Democrats. I have friends that are independents. Uh, and yet I want to endeavor to share with you, again, um, uh, metaphors and a satire uh, in respect to uh, using uh, uh, God's word and literature and, uh, and kind of an exaggeration somewhat on this uh, um, ideal that God chose a radical Republican and a, and a Democrat on his team and yet through uh, the very person of Jesus Christ brought them together and changed their world view in respect to both party affiliations, both party affiliations. So Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, and um, it, reads, it reads this. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, there is Simon called Peter, his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee, his brother John, Philip Bartholomew, Thomas, notice, beloved, you may want to circle uh, this individual for today, Matthew the tax collector, or he was also called the publican. He was a public servant of Rome. James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon the zealot, you may want to circle him uh, as well, uh, these two, Matthew the tax collector or publican, and Simon the zealot will be our two uh, political um, activists today. And of course, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. 
So that's our first scripture in respect to this uh, sermonette that Jesus had a radical Republican and a Democrat on his team. And I want to bring some thoughts to that. And then secondly, beloved, if you would turn to uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. I want you to find it in your Bible and underline it. And have a brick and mortar Bible and make notes on it. And um, continue to allow uh, um, your life to become fully acquainted uh, with God's word. Mark chapter 12, 13 through 17. Reading here out of the Amplified Version, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus in order to trap him into making a statement that they could use against Jesus. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are, watch beloved, Amplified says, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and you have no personal biases towards anyone. Did you hear that? We know that you are truthful and that you have no personal biases towards anyone. For you are not influenced by outward appearances, social status, political affiliations. But in truth, you teach the way of God. Beloved, did you hear that? He again declares, teacher, we know that you are truthful you have no personal biases towards anyone. Wow. For you are not influenced by outward appearances, social status, political affiliations. But in truth, you teach the way of God. Now, that's something for you and I in this uh, um, uh, season of midterm elections and what is happening within our nation and the voting and the selections of the House of Representatives and the, uh, and the Senate that Jesus is underlining and laying framework uh, for your life and mine that we to his body, that we are truthful, we have no personal biases towards anyone, uh, skin color, okay, race, Creed, class, pedigree, money, appearance, um, uh, stardom, whomever, Jesus declared, no personal bias towards anyone. He said, for you're not influenced by outward opinions, by social status, political affiliations, but in truth, you teach the way of God. And um, he goes on to say, uh, should we pay tax or not pay tax? And um, he said, bring me a coin. And he goes on to say, render to Caesar what is Caesar, etc., etc. So let's, let's come all the way back here now and begin to uh, uh, tie in some aspects of what is taking place uh, and has taken place within the uh, country, the nation that you and I are, <coughs> are uh, living in, the United States of America. Now, our nation's uh, finished uh, voting uh, in what is called midterm elections. Now, I'm just going to give a small civics lesson or political science lesson. And again, I'm not uh, uh, up in, uh, to uh, the standards of any um, civics teacher or what have you. I'm, I'm recalling certain aspects of what civics and political science is. And so I'm just going to give a small framework and kind of build this up here. So during the midterm elections, uh, primarily, there were two aspects or two um, directions of voting. One was for uh, those in the House of Representatives and, and also voting for those within the Senate. Uh, these are the two uh, bedrocks of what is called the U.S. Congress. The House of Representatives has 435 seats or openings, um, and the, uh, the Senate, the second aspect of Congress, has 100 seats, and um, 35 uh, were open during the voting uh, that took place just uh, the last week and a half. 
And uh, so uh, what is important to recognize in respect to this uh, understanding of uh, Jesus choosing a radical Republican and a Democrat and changing their worldview because of him and the kingdom of God is that in the, uh, in the nation you and I live in, these two prominent uh, um, bedrock aspects of Congress, the House of Representatives, again, 435 seats that were open and voted for, and uh, this particular aspect of Congress, the House of Representatives, now listen, don't snooze on me like I did during my civics <laughs> lesson. Uh, what happens here in that uh, aspect of Congress is those individuals that each state votes for. For example, depending on the population of that state, they will carry more seats or more people to vote in the House of Representatives. Um, Los, or excuse me, California, because of the size, 40 million people uh, within that state, they are granted and given for, uh, 50, I think it's 53 seats and individuals that they will send to the House of Representatives to vote uh, in respect to what the people have desired and what uh, the uh, uh, dynamics that they were uh, declaring that they would represent. And so uh, Vermont would only have one seat uh, because of a smaller population. Delaware would only have one seat. And so 435 vacancies, and so the country voted for midterm elections. Now, this particular aspect of Congress, the House of Representatives, is important in respect to who has the majority. The House of Representatives primarily uh, would propose bills uh, in respect to or, or uh, aspects that they want to see implemented into our country. Um, they would also begin to introduce aspects of, of revenue bills and uh, um, uh, monies going to Ukraine, for example, would start in respect as a bill from the House of Representatives and they would then uh, pass that on to the Senate, and the Senate of 100 members would vote uh, to then send that uh, package to the president to sign off on. Again, the importance of the House of Representatives and what took place in our midterm elections is that if you have a majority in respect to those 435 representatives, then you can endeavor to uh, uh, push uh, and to uh, begin to bring those policies and desires and directions from that particular political affiliation, Republican or Democrat, uh, primarily. Secondly, there was the voting for the Senate. There were 35 seats that were vacant, and um, the uh, nation voted, uh, some voted, uh, uh, in respect to those vacancies and those senators. Now, if I read correctly this morning, it uh, seems that the Democratic uh, political party uh, has now a majority in the Senate um, because of what took place in Nevada and Arizona. Um, and even though Georgia hasn't been decided yet, that means that there is a majority of that particular uh, uh, party, that uh, political party, which would be the Democrats, uh, uh, once again, that would have the majority to actually decide uh, what they would like to do with the bills that came up from the House of Representatives and pass those and move the particular agendas and policies and decrees from that political uh, party, the Democrats, and then send them to uh, the President Biden for uh, his signature. So we come all the way back that what took place in midterms was extremely important because whoever can carry the majority of the House of Representatives and the majority of the Senate will be able to further the desires, the goals, the agendas, the decisions and choices of that political party's desire. Now, the House of Representatives looks like the majority is going to be uh, given back to uh, the Republican Party and that affiliation. 
And so uh, there will be some stalemates in respect to certain aspects of what takes place. The Senate, its primary objective is to uh, 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 bring in nominations. If there's a Supreme Court opening, then the, the Senate will vote and uh, will elect and uh, will bring in that Supreme Court judge. Uh, uh, the Senate will also bring in uh, other bills to pass them nominations. Uh, they will also bring in a, a host of areas uh, that they can uh, uh, pass on to the president's signature. So again, uh, uh, if one has an, a majority in either one of those uh, aspects of the House of Representatives and the, um, the Senate has a majority, it will determine the direction, the outcome, and the uh, uh, immediate future of this country. Um, these uh, elections are most important, even more so than um, electing a presidency, because if uh, a party affiliation, Republican or Democrat, controls both majority House of Representatives and the Senate, then they can pass uh, certain uh, bills and certain legislature regardless whether the president vetoes those or not so long as they have two-thirds of a vote. And so this uh, midterm election was uh, and is always uh, extremely important. And, uh, and so that's a small understanding of uh, just kind of what took place in the last week or two. Again, to summarize, uh, it looks like the 435 seats of the House of Representatives will probably have a majority of the Republican Party and, and they will present bills and certain things to the Senate. Now the Senate um, is going to have a majority of the Democratic Party and so there's going to be some stalemates from the House of Representatives from the Republican desires and choices and bringing those bills up to the Senate for them to pass but since they are a Democratic affiliation, they will probably turn away most of those. And so that is going to be a hardship for the Republicans. And uh, the Senate will have trouble because they won't be able to have certain bills formated and, and passed through the House of Representatives because the House of Representatives has a Republican majority. Okay, now what's that got to do with you and with me and with our country? Well, again, I want to bring the, the understanding that Jesus chose a radical Republican and a Democrat on his team. You and I read here then in Matthew 10, 2 through 4, that Matthew was chosen by Jesus Christ, and he was a tax collector, a, a, a publican. He actually was employed by the government of Rome. Uh, and uh, he also, Jesus, he chose Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot is uh, the radical Republican. If you let me just kind of uh, uh, release a satire, a metaphor uh, here and try to bring some spiritual uh, aspects uh, of what, what was happening here. Now, Simon the Zealot, Jesus chose him on his team. Again, he is the radical uh, Republican. And uh, uh, his uh, zealot wasn't his last name. Simon the zealot wasn't his last name. As a matter of fact, if you peruse through your Bible, you don't see any last names. Last names, uh, at least historically, did not come to uh, present themselves uh, until about the 11th century. Now, there are some that believe maybe China and India had last names that they were referred to, um, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the 11th century. But we do know primarily in the 11th century, people were identified then with their last name. But up until then, there were four ways where people were identified. I, I want you to know this is important. So we see here that Jesus chose Simon the Zealot. Zealot wasn't his last name. Again, uh, people were not uh, um, understood by even a last name until the 11th century primarily. Uh, Zealot, uh, uh, again, uh, was uh, not his last name. And I'm going to give you quickly the four 
primary ways people were identified up until the 11th century and in Bible days, how did they uh, identify someone? Number one uh, was this, it, uh, it, 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 uh, they were identified by their trade or by their occupation. Um, for example, uh, of the five different Simons, one was called Simon the Tanner. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 6, Peter actually stayed in Simon the Tanner's house when he received a vision. Simon was a tanner, and he was noted, and he was selected, or at least identified, because of his trade. He was a tanner. Uh, secondly, in terms of how people were identified before the 11th century or in Bible days, was their place of growing up was their place of growing up. John 1, 45, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. Christ means anointed one. He was identified as Jesus, the, uh, the Christ, the anointed one, the anointed Messiah. Okay, and so we see here that the second aspect uh, in respect to identifying uh, people in the uh, times of the Bible had to do with, one, their trade. Number two, it had to do here, again, where they grew up. Judas Iscariot, okay, the betrayer, uh, the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, Iscariot, wasn't his last name. In the Greek, it actually was Kerioth, and it was, it was where he was from, Judas from Iscariot or Kerioth. That's how they identified him. The third way that uh, men and women in the Bible and uh, beforehand were identified, uh, number three was uh, they were identified by, their, uh, by the Father, the Son of uh, Matthew 16, 17, uh, Simon bar Jonah, bar means son uh, in the Greek, Simon bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. He was identified, um, uh, this apostle, Simon Peter or Simon bar Jonah, he was identified primarily because he was the son of Jonah. That was his father's name. And then lastly, important, beloved, uh, that uh, men and women were identified by an aspect of character, disposition, actions, um, and certain uh, uh, aspects about their, their personal and personality. Uh, uh, Mark 3.17, James and John, they were called sons of thunder. So they were identified in respect to their, uh, uh, their personalities. They were identified because of their dispositions and actions. They were called James and John the sons of thunder. Um, and here we find the radical Republican that Jesus chose on his team. He was called Simon the Zealot. It wasn't his last name. He wasn't identified by his trade. He wasn't identified by where he grew up. He wasn't identified uh, because of his father's first name. He was identified because of his radical um, uh, aspects of being a, uh, a political activist, uh, if you will. Uh, and I'll explain more of the Republican Party. And yet, listen, beloved, Jesus chose him. He was a zealot, okay. Zealot, you have the root word zeal. This one Jesus chose as an apostle. He was coming from an extreme uh, uh, right, if you will, right-winged area. And he was called a zealot. He, zeal, on fire, burning, radical, uh, uh, unwavering, refusing to budge. Uh, so the, the, the definition of a zealot or a zealot, anyone who is fervent, fervently, radically supporting a particular cause and unwavering. And uh, it was here in the, uh, that Simon the Zealot, uh, um, uh, his political party uh, was against the reigning government and the government officials and those that would um, have an affinity and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a declaration and a vote uh, for uh, the government of Rome, uh, which I will call the democratic affiliation um, uh, at this point here. 
And so we see that he, uh, uh, he was zealous for Jewish independence, Simon the Zealot. Um, he wanted to overthrow Rome. Uh, he hoped to accomplish this by inciting people to uh, rebel, to drive out uh, the Romans from Israel, and to bring back uh, uh, the theocracy or the uh, desires that Moses laid down. And he would target other Jews, Simon the Zealot, uh, that were sympathetic and, and, and were uh, uh, embracing uh, the policies, the ways, the agendas of Rome and the Roman government. Josephus, who was a historian during that time, would speak uh, quite a bit about Simon the Zealot and how he had such a zeal. Uh, the Bible says in uh, Proverbs 19.2, there is a zeal without God's knowledge in Simon the Zealot the one filled with zeal for um, radical uh, republicanisms uh, and uh, radical at this point Jewish and Judaisms. There was a zeal without knowledge. And again, Jesus still, still chose him. Simon the Zealot, he hated uh, the current government of his time, again, which was Rome. Uh, he hated their leadership. He hated all that they stood for. Uh, he hated their ideals, the policies, their thinking. Um, he hated the, uh, the overriding uh, governor of, uh, of, uh, of Judea, uh, Pontius Pilate. Uh, he hated uh, the president, if you will, uh, King Herod, the emperor, uh, whom Jesus called that little fox, Herod Antipas. Ant Antipas. And so he was a present day, if you let me, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, uh, shout me down. Uh, he hated um, Simon the Zealot. He hated the present day government that he was in. He wanted Israel uh, to go back to its roots, to go back to the Mosaic or Moses' uh, theocracy or, or doctrines and teachings in Israel. And yet because of the government of Rome and the policies and the agendas, uh, the entire uh, 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 nation of Israel was becoming contaminated in Men and women, even those of the Jewish faith, were beginning to uh, forfeit um, those uh, radical ideas from the, from the far right of uh, republicanism and just begin to say there's no use. We might as well just uh, submit to them and just go along. It isn't going to change. And so this was what was happening in the, uh, in the heart of Simon the Zealot. He had such a, um, a, a zeal for Israel. He had such a love for his country. Uh, and, uh, and a desire to see, listen now, to see it restored. And so now after this, uh, uh, after this election, many uh, of you who have voted for the Republican uh, Party because many of you watching me uh, and listening uh, because you uh, have chosen um, those, uh, many of those within the Republican Party because of their biblical policies and their biblical stance. And yet uh, in that, uh, we see that what took place in our midterm elections uh, was anything but what uh, was called to be a red wave or a Republican sweep of majority of votes in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And so many of you have uh, cried out and voiced uh, such disappointment and even some depression uh, because of what took place within this uh, aspects of the midterm elections. And uh, we, 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 we're wondering uh, now what about social issues? We wonder about uh, the climate issues and the contentions. And, uh, and we're wondering what now and how come and where is God and what's going to take place uh, within, uh, within, our, uh, within our country. And so Simon the Zealot, Jesus picked him on his team. And if you will again, he was a uh, right-winged zealot, political activist that hated his present-day government. He was totally against it. He was against the policies, the agendas, what was taking place to his country, to his fellow Jew, quote, and or Christian. And he saw what was happening and he endeavored to instigate rebellions and riots and especially for those Jews that began to join um, their passive uh, uh, affiliations now to the Roman government. 
And that's what was taking place when Jesus began to pick, uh, to pick his team. Now, Jesus went then and he picked, if you allow me, he picked a Democrat. <laughs> he picked a Democrat. He picked Matthew the publican and Matthew the tax collector. Again, another scripture, Matthew 9, 9, Jesus went out from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth and said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. So we find here that Jesus not only picked a zealot, a political activist, uh, a, 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 a man who burned uh, in respect to his desires and passions to see Israel restored under God. And yet Jesus also handpicked a publican, a man who uh, had been in uh, service and had been involved in the Roman government for years and years and years. Matthew, this Matthew, the tax collector, the publican, actually was a Jew. And so he was disenfranchised by, if you will, by the Jewish um, zealousness. He was disenfranchised by uh, what uh, Simon the Zealot was presenting to him. Josephus, the Jewish historian during the time that was happening here, I have all of his materials. He writes, not Bible, just history. He writes that this one, Matthew, that Jesus hand-selected had been employed by the Roman government for years. Uh, this one, Matthew, was a Jew by birth. And yet, because of bribes, betrayals, backstabbing, lying, etc., he worked himself, I'm quoting, into a monetary position of power and as a tax collector and a Republican. And uh, we see that uh, Simon the Zealot was uh, filled with such anger and rage that this one, uh, Matthew, would begin to uh, move from, as it were, the Republican Party to the Democrat Party and actually begin to work uh, within the government, to the Gentile government itself. Matthew was a Jew. He forfeited his heritage. He forfeited his nationalism. And he was a, tender, a tenured government official. He believed again in the Roman government. Uh, he believed that his Jewish uh, position, uh, he believed that the Jewish position of the, uh, uh, many of the Orthodox Jews was extreme. Uh, he, uh, uh, he believed that the Rome's uh, government approach of ideals, policies, and freedoms were something that he would rather endeavor to live with. And so again, we have these two extremes coming together on the team that Jesus began to pick. You have Simon the Zealot who was in uh, total uh, disagreement and in, uh, and in opposition towards uh, a fellow Jew like Matthew, who actually, again, was employed with, uh, with the government. Polar opposites uh, within the political parties and views and beliefs. Um, and, and yet again, I underline this fact, beloved, uh, that Jesus chose them both. He chose them both. Now, again, I issued a disclaimer to you uh, that I voted for those candidates that voiced and declared Biblical uh, positions, regardless of skin color, regardless of uh, money, regardless of biases, uh, because I know that that is what God has for this country and this nation, again, regardless of uh, political affiliations. And yet, again, I want to bring this to you, that Jesus chose, if you will, he chose a, uh, a Republican zealot, Simon, and he chose one who was deeply uh, involved and engaged, a Democrat, uh, Matthew, uh, that had crossed over. Uh, into uh, uh, viewing and, and proclaiming and declaring his allegiance to the Roman government. Now, what does this mean to you and what does this mean to me in respect to the midterm elections? What does it mean to the Republicans? What does it mean to the Democrats today? And so I'm going to just bring a few things right here to hopefully uh, bring um, you and I into a biblical uh, foundation for how to manage our uh, differences from the Republican Party and the Democrat Party and what took place within Jesus' team, having Matthew the tax collector and the publican and having Simon the zealot. 
Number one, it's important that you and I, even though many of you are depressed and, and disappointed in respect to how the voting took place, I noted and found that uh, the uh, registered voters uh, in Texas um, actually only had um, uh, less than half of registered voters in Texas even voted. Okay, and we see that across the entire nation that you and I live in. There's not even an impetus uh, for people to vote because primarily uh, George Barna research says that people don't even trust anyone in government in respect to those um, agendas and policies and ideals and so many didn't vote. That's not the answer either. So what does this mean for you and I? Number one, listen, Jesus Christ loves all people, listen now, regardless of political affiliation. I'm going to say it again. Jesus Christ loves all people um, beyond political affiliation. Here's my question to you today. Uh, does your political uh, uh, affiliation and your political affection, regardless, regardless, does it obscure your love for all people? Jesus loves all people. He loves Matthew and loved Matthew, the Roman tax collector and publican. And if you will, he loved the Democrat. He also loved Simon the Zealot. Uh, filled with zeal, but a zeal without knowledge. He brought them both together and he loves all people regardless of political affiliation. Does your political affiliation, is it obscuring your love for him or her? You and I read again in our uh, Mark 12, 13 through 17 that Jesus did not have any biases nor political uh, uh, affiliations nor influence by any of those arenas of his life. He, the Bible says, uh, Romans uh, 5, 8, that while you and I were yet sinners, he, watch, commended his love towards you. Even when you were an enemy, he still loved and loves you and I, and he loves all people. I'm going to say it again. He loves all people. Yes, he loves Democrats, Matthew the tax collector, the publican, and he loves uh, the uh, uh, Democrat, and he loves the Republicans. He loves the independents. It's not about the affiliations. You and I cannot allow uh, those differences, no matter how passionate Simon the Zealot was. Jesus brought him together and Matthew together, and he actually began to use his own life the Son of God, to begin to change um, uh, their, their entireties of, of their thinking, of their lives, and of their worldview. Jesus isn't trying to get someone, watch, to change their political affiliation. Jesus' mandate isn't to bring a Republican to the Democrats and the Democrats to the Republican. He, he's not trying to change political affiliations. He's trying to change people's hearts. He's trying to change people's hearts. Once Matthew and once Simon the Zealot, can you imagine when Jesus brought those two together? You know the dynamics of, uh, of that opposition was electric, and yet Jesus knew that through him, watch, their worldview would be changed, one as well as the other. One as well as the other. Jesus brought them together, and he began to change the worldview. Listen, beloved, listen. You and I are not going to change someone who is not truly born again in respect to what's happening within our country. Someone whose spirit is still dormant and dead, the Bible says, that it's not born again, is not going to have the same, watch, worldview that you are. They, you and I have been enlightened. Uh, you've been born again. Your, the Bible says the scales have fallen from your eyes. So you understand what's happening in the world that you and I live in. I got a, 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 a text from a, a woman who was... Uh, uh, at a marketplace, and she was uh, at a grade school, and I think it was a Halloween um, um, show that was taking place as well in this uh, uh, local school's gymnasium with all of the kids there, second graders through fourth graders, I believe. 
And as she was setting up for her market and her table uh, in respect to the marketplace there, uh, that she saw that there was a transgender uh, um, man slash woman in respect to his presentation uh, up in front of these grade school kids at a public grade school. And some parents were there, and teachers were there, and administrators were there. And again, there isn't going to be uh, a a change of a worldview uh, unless there is a born-again experience, not just someone saying, I believe in God, I believe in God. Not just someone who goes to a church or goes to church. There must be the truly born again, begotten from above, that truly now opens up the eyes of those uh, and the agendas and the policies that are anti-God, anti-God's word, anti-Christ. Those that aren't truly born again, their worldview does not see the policies, the agendas, the situations that are happening within your nation and mine. They don't see what that truly is in respect to a spirit. How can they not see that? How come they don't think that's wrong? How come, how come this can keep happening? And so I'm sharing with you, number one, that you and I still have to choose to love people regardless of political affiliation. And that is a decision and a choice that you and I realize that while you were yet an enemy, Christ chose you. He chose Christ, he chose the Democrat, and he chose the radical Republican, knowing that through Christ, he wasn't going to change the political affiliations of each. He was going to change their heart, where they all became, listen, co-laborers for God. Christ and his kingdom. That's what we're praying for, and it's going to have to be upon our knees where we see this nation truly. An awakening will take place. There must come a born again experience. Trying to argue and trying to present and trying to say A, B, C. Uh, the Bible says, not by might, uh, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Says the Lord. So, so just know you're going to be frustrated trying to reshape uh, someone who's not born again in their life. Number two, what's this mean for me in terms of the midterm elections? Number two, uh, the Bible says that all of the disciples left Christ when they found out that he wasn't going to overthrow the present government of his time. Roman government. They were liberal. They were, uh, they, they, the, the, the policies and the agendas and, and the uh, allowance and the uh, sexualities and, and everything known to man. The disciples all but one left Jesus Christ when he declared to them in John 1836, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would be fighting for me. That I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. There is coming a time, beloved, in, uh, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. He will set up, Bible says, he'll set up his kingdom for a thousand years. You will see a, a total transformation and a total change of every area that we know of in the kingdom of this earth that we live in. There will be a total a total radical change of the financial system. There'll be a total change of technology, a total change of education, a total change. A thousand years here, Christ on the earth. Many of you will be here on the earth as well, governing with him. There'll be a total radical different kingdom that he will establish on his second coming. Uh, So let me ask you with with that, uh, does the midterm elections for the Republican... Uh, Does that cause you uh, uh, to become less active, uh, to become uh, um, more uh, um, uh, passive in respect to your uh, voice for Christ and for uh, your activity for Christ's kingdom? Were you more vocal and more active for a political party than Christ's kingdom? 
So, 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 so is there a greater passion, a greater zeal for your political party than for Jesus Christ? The, the disciples wanted Christ to overthrow the Roman government, and he didn't, and so they left him. And so their passion, their zeal, uh, their voice, their actions, uh, their sacrifice um, became null and void once Christ didn't overthrow the present Democratic government, and so I have to ask you and I, um, has that, will that slow you down in respect to pursuing Jesus Christ, his word, his kingdom, and being active within that realm of, of your life? And number three, I uh, don't have time, but if I shared with you the history of Christianity in this nation and what God has established from its origin uh, you and I, uh, and I'll just share this, you should have great uh, comfort and encouragement uh, uh, because of, uh, of, of God setting this nation up as a headship and as a beacon for all other nations. That when there is great darkness, the history of God's people in this nation has rallied them to ardent prayer and passion and has resulted in mighty revivals through the history of this country to whom God has blessed, has blessed. So I want you to be uh, 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 um, filled with a sense of comfort for those of you that did not see uh, the Republican uh, uh, policies and, uh, and, uh, and midterms, the way that uh, you have prayed, realize uh, this, that uh, it can cause God's people here in, the, in our country to unite as never before. Isaiah 59, 19, the Bible says, when the enemy comes in, okay, you and I see that. If you've been truly born again, you understand what's happening he said, when the enemy comes in, watch, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Many people quote this scripture, when the enemy comes in like a flood, even your Bible will have a comma, although there are no commas in the original Greek and original Hebrew. When the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And you and I can take great comfort knowing that in the darkest of times, in the most deepest of despair, and, uh, and as Rome was uh, encircling the, uh, uh, the uh, desires of God himself, uh, there was a mighty revival that actually took place there. But even, even so here, uh, Isaiah 9, 1 through 8. Watch what the prophet says. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom, for those who are in distress, <clears throat> for the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, watch, a light has dawned. For you have enlarged the nation, you have increased their joy. They rejoice before you. And the people rejoice at the harvest as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Watch. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you remember Gideon and that, that uh, war that he won. You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior uh, in battle and the garments have been rolled in blood and will... Uh, destined for burning will be fuel for the fire. Watch verse 6. For a child is born unto us. A son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Christ. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. And the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. And he will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice, righteousness from that time on and forever. For the true zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Notice, beloved, a great light came upon those in darkness. A great light began to come. And again, when you and I see what's happening around us, we, we, we only have uh, this 
armament is to pray and ask God to awaken those that are blinded and those that cannot see what is truly happening within our country. And because of this darkness and the challenges and the sadnesses of agendas and policies that are anti-God's word and anti-Christ's spirit, it is going to unite God's people and a great light is going to come upon those in darkness and we will see uh, the, the uh, reformation, we will see the transformation of this country in Jesus' precious name. So I conclude with this. Matthew the publican and Simon the zealot were opposite ends of the political spectrum. But because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ, they became brothers and co-workers for the gospel. Both of their worldviews were changed because of him. It is unfortunate today that many believers seem to be more committed to a political party, a political viewpoint, a passion than to Jesus Christ, his gospel, and his kingdom. So beloved, I bring it all around to say that Jesus chose a radical, zealot, activist Republican by the name of Simon, and he chose one, if you let me, who is steeped uh, in the government of, of Rome, a, a Democrat, and yet he brought them together and brought forth two apostles that were joined because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray. I hope that didn't ruffle too many feathers out there, but hopefully you will see what, uh, what I was trying to share through God's precious word. Father, I thank you again um, for those that are listening and watching, and I lift up this country to you. I lift up the House of Representatives. I lift up the Senate. I lift up all aspects and dynamics of our political uh, parties and affiliations, and we Today, we, we gather together and we uh, choose to ask you uh, to convict us when our political affiliations obscure our love for someone. You have called us by even the Apostle Paul to pray for those who are in leadership. Um, you have called us to pray for Pontius Pilate, that governor. You have called us to pray for um, the emperor, um, President Herod Antipas, you have called us to pray for President Biden. And so, Lord, forgive us uh, for allowing our political affiliations and desires, even uh, possibly rightly so, for your kingdom and for your word and for your policies and agendas to be established. Yet, forgive us for uh, if we are lacking love, uh, Lord, it is of no avail. And so, Please forgive us and help us now uh, to see uh, people who are made in your image properly and call us to pray and to stand in the gap and to stand in the hedges, O oh God, and bring forth a mighty a light into this country as never before. Use what is meant for evil and bring forth good for the <coughs> glory of Jesus Christ. And, oh God, I uh, would pray again uh, for those 435 representatives and those 100 senators. Nothing is impossible with you. That your spirit, uh, uh, even like uh, uh, Cyrus, you can reach down and give them dreams and visions and change their hearts and lives that they might become truly born again uh, uh, under the very uh, canopy of Jesus Christ. We bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.